we start talking about how to quantify left ventricular function, you have to understand which factors actually influence the way the heart functions. So we have to look at myocardial mechanics and hemodynamics. Well, here are some of the factors that influence how the heart works. First of all, contractility, which is basically the force that is produced by the myocardium. We can measure it with the help of DPDT, which is the change in pressure in relationship to the time. Of course, a number of factors affect the contractility. The sympathetic tone, for example, if a patient is very nervous, he'll be hypercontractile. You can see that during echocardiography very frequently. The amount of catecholamines a patient has, just think of patients who are in the intensive care unit who get catecholamines, other drugs such as digitalis, and also an increase in afterload. But preload also affects the contractility. Preload is basically the amount of volume that is filled into the left ventricle. And if you have a patient who has a high end diastolic volume, then the preload will be increased. If the patient is hypovolemic, then the preload will be reduced. So volume, the filling pressures, and inflow obstruction. For example, if a patient has mitral stenosis, will definitely influence the preload of the left ventricle. And finally, afterload. Now, afterload basically is the wall stress of the left ventricle during the time of injection. This is influenced by a number of factors. First of all, by the size of the ventricle. Take a look at this man who is blowing up the balloon. I guess you can appreciate that at the initial phases of blowing up the balloon, when it is still small, the wall stress is still relatively high. Then once it reaches a certain size, the wall stress gets less again. So size plays an important role. But not only that, it's also systolic blood pressure. For example, if you have a patient who is hypertensive, then the afterload is increased. The same is true for patients who have aortic stenosis. And even for patients who have aortic regurgitation, there we will also have at least some degree of an increase in afterload. But there are also conditions where afterload is decreased. For example, in mitral regurgitation, if drugs are instilled such as vasodilators, ACE inhibitors, or angiotensin receptor blockers. But why do you care about all these hemodynamic factors? Well, let me show you some clinical examples where they play an important role. Here is a patient who has mitral regurgitation. In this case, afterload is reduced because there is a hole in the mitral valve and lots of the pressure is released into the left atrium. So the ventricle in this case looks better than it actually is. So in this situation, the true contractility of the myocardium is overestimated if we just look at how the ventricle is moving. In the middle, you have an example of a patient who has an increase in afterload. This is a patient who has aortic stenosis. You see the valve is calcified and the ventricle has to pump against this high resistance. Now this is just the opposite of the previous example. Now we'll have a ventricle which looks worse than it actually is. If you relieve the afterload, for example, if you operate the patient, the ventricle will improve in function. And on the right-hand side, you have a patient who has tamponade. In this case, there is no filling of the ventricle. So there's a reduction in preload. In other words, the ventricle, again, will look worse than it actually is. In this situation, you cannot estimate how left ventricle function truly is. And after we released the pericardial effusion and volume again entered the left ventricle, function improved. So these are just three of many hemodynamic situations where you have to consider all the factors I discussed previously. At the end of the day, the heart has to generate a certain stroke volume or cardiac output which is adapted to the certain needs of the patient at that moment. For example, if the patient is at rest, it will be different than if the patient is exercising it will have to be different under certain pathological conditions. And it does this, of course, by altering these factors here and also by the way the heart muscle pumps. We'll be talking more about myocardial mechanics a little bit later.
But it's very important to understand that the heart doesn't always function the same way. And if there's, for example, a reduction in the contractility because the patient has cardiomyopathy or because the preload is increased or the afterload is increased, then there are a number of compensatory mechanisms we can still try to keep the cardiac output at the level that the body actually needs. Of course, if we have a patient who's deteriorating with function at some certain point, the compensatory mechanisms will not be sufficient anymore. In this situation, you will have a drop in cardiac output, first during exercise and then later even at rest. Keep this in mind. When we perform echocardiography, we're looking at the patient on one specific condition, at rest. We do not really know what the heart function really is under exercise conditions. We do not know what the functional capacity of the heart in reality is. This is certainly one of the major limitations of a rest echocardiogram. Again, why is it so important to understand all of these compensatory mechanisms? I would like to show you in some examples, looking at mitral regurgitation. Here you have three different clinical states of mitral regurgitation. You have an acute mitral regurgitation, you have a chronic compensated mitral regurgitation and chronic decompensated condition. In this situation, the patient had a rupture of a leaflet. Of course, we have massive mitral regurgitation, but the ventricle has not yet time to adapt to this increase in volume overload. So what happens? The sympathetic tone kicks in and the patient is extremely hyperdynamic. The ventricle is very, very small. In this situation, a patient had a mitral valve prolapse and over time the patient started to adapt to this volume overload and the ventricle dilates. So you see he's still hyperdynamic but not nearly as hyperdynamic as this patient is. In this situation here the ventricle now is deteriorating because of volume overload and because of the increased workload that the left ventricle has to perform in he slowly deteriorates. Now He's decompensated. He cannot adapt to the increase in volume overload anymore and obviously the patient will have uh, increase in filling pressures, he will be symptomatic and obviously he needs some form of treatment. So keep this in mind. This ventricle in judging the left ventricle function will be much different than this ventricle and this ventricle. This is exactly what the teaching point of this lecture is. Did you ever have the chance to look at the heart, how it really contracts, maybe during open heart surgery? Well, surgeons knew this all along. The heart does not only contract concentrically towards the middle, but it shows a very awkward motion. As a matter of fact, it contracts like the rinsing of a towel, where we have a counterclockwise rotation at the apex and a clockwise rotation at the base of the heart. At the same time, the heart actually shortens in length. So there are a number of different motions which you can discern at the moment of systole. It's the radial motion, where we have the myocardial muscle moving towards the center of the heart. At the same time, we have kind of a twisting, rotational, circumferential motion of the myocardium. And then finally, we also have a shortening of the ventricle in length. All of these three components are very important. And they're important because that way the heart can be very efficient in the way it contracts. With relatively little decrease in the length of the myocardial fibers, we get a very large decrease in the true size of the ventricle and therefore a very big or high cardiac output. Take a look at this short axis view. Here you will see that not only is there an inward motion, but actually the muscle fibers are also rotating a little bit. Now this rotation depends of course on the level of the short axis view. This is the motion that we tend to look at most prominently and it also plays a very important role obviously in contraction. It's the radial motion inwards, how the endocardium moves towards the center of the heart. Mm -hmm.